Uh, good morning, everybody. To kick off the technical training meeting, uh, we've talked a little bit in the past that we'll be updating the distributed system interconnection guide. Uh, version 11 is available now. Um, that blue wording up there, that's a link. So when you get this, uh, this document, you'll be able to click on that to get to it. It's also located um, where the dig was located previously. I'm going to speak a little bit um, at a high level of, of just changes that were made to the dig and then Stu will talk more to you know specific content changes uh, as we address things like energy storage systems later on in this presentation. Um, just real quick, the dig um, it's uh, Austin Energy's extra rules for solar systems, energy storage, electrical vehicle charging. Um, it's something that anybody working in the field uh, should be familiar with. Um, it's free, it's available online, you can print it out if you like. Um, the major updates to the existing doc, we rearranged section C, uh, and that's that general requirement and layout section. Uh, sections before section C have a lot to do with process flows, and um, section C is probably where your design team will spend most of their time for residential solar systems. Um, and can also be used as a reference for commercial solar systems as well. Um, what we've done, uh, taking feedback from a previous technical meeting of uh, your comments on the inspector checklist, we have gone ahead and reviewed items in the checklist, moved them over into our general requirements and layout section. Uh, we've reworded them for clarity. Uh, there were some that, that you guys commented uh, we're not, we're not super clear. So we've done our best to, uh, make sure that everything now is, uh, orderly, um, you know, very clear and located in the spot where you can find our other requirements. So now, if you're wondering if there's anything special that you need to do for Austin and area solar systems, go ahead to section C general requirements and layouts. It's like page 24. Um, we've got some drawings and then, um, you know, we, we organize it by, uh, by the system components, which is seen on the page. Um, we did add a few new items. Um, a lot of it has to do with energy storage systems. And of course, uh, we care a lot about labels and plaques, uh, especially for um, our first responders, which did give some input into our, um, you know, into our process of updating the guide. So Stu will talk to that uh, further on. Um, Probably the largest content change so large, even I will mention it, is that we are not allowing any interconnection of the energy storage equipment on the solar side of the PV meter. We want to be really clear that from the PV meter to the end of the solar system, it should only be PV equipment. We're not you know, incorporating any sort of battery loads or anything. Um, and we, we do that to make sure that your customers can get the full value of solar credit that they think they're going to be getting when they install solar. Um, so if you walk away with anything, uh, leaving this meeting, besides knowing that there is a document called the dig available to you, please, you know, make sure that your sales team isn't selling any sort of energy storage systems that would interconnect behind that PV, uh, meter. Um, and of course, uh, we're, we're in the city of Austin. A lot of the dig does uh, reference um, material that we got from the Austin fire department, but you always want to check with your local fire department outside of Austin. I know it seems like a lot of extra work, but um, you know, we want to keep those guys safe. Um, yeah, go ahead to the next slide. Thank you. Um, yeah, uh, so also we talked about the um, checklist being updated. So the way that, that we've kind of reorganized this, hopefully, so, uh, you guys can use the dig effectively and quickly. Um, section C outlines all of these requirements um, and should be used for your reference. Um, there's a general requirement section, and then we have three simplified diagrams, one through three. Uh, we removed some that uh, that had ESS, uh, you know, one lines that we wouldn't accept. Um, so then you can refer to those diagrams if you would like. Um, and then Appendix C, which used to be page 63, um, it's page 63 and page 64, is the new checklist. Um, and they all sort of work together. So um, if you want to go to the next slide, this is the last one. Um, so 
Um, again, high level table of contents, you can see section C is organized by the major system components that, that you would uh, be working with when, when doing a residential installation. Um, and then appendix C, that checklist, uh, the numbers correspond. So if you get an inspection uh, and if you are able to view one of these checklists, I know our inspectors are uploading them uh, to the ABC portal um, and, you know, something's checked off and you think that it looks right, you can go ahead, they'll say something about the uh, um, additional disconnects, item 10 gets checked off. You can then go to additional disconnects, which would be page um, 32, as you can see over in section C, and then see whatever our specific requirements are that may be above and beyond what the NEC is. So um, yeah, we encourage all of your guys in the field to be familiar with the DIG and do be on the lookout for uh, the checklists, which which are being uploaded into ABC uh, portal, so that we can communicate any you know reasons for failures. Uh, I know also EECP is also taking care of this a little bit for y'all, um, but this is just another place to find it. And that pretty much summarizes uh, what I was going to address with the dig changes. Uh, if you want to go to the next slide, and if anybody has questions. Um, I can certainly answer anything content based and and Stu can also jump jump into if if people have specific questions about the uh, line items and, and code changes, but he'll be addressing that in a minute. All right, sounds good. Well, yeah, moving on. I'm going to pass the mic as well. All right. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, this next announcement is particularly important for those of you who request and coordinate uh, the solar inspections for your company. Uh, so as of today, we are rolling out a new process for requesting your inspections and a new tool through which we will schedule those inspections for you. So uh, to this point, you've been used to having two different uh, channels for requesting rebated projects inspections and non rebated inspections as well as additional types of uh, rough inspections and pre-construction meetings. So uh, as of today, we're rolling out the first stage of this new process. Um, we've created a solar inspection request form that you will be able to find uh, on the website. We'll show you the web page uh, on the next slide through which you can find that form. But um, this form will be used for all final inspections in the near future. It will also be used for all rough inspections, requests for all pre-construction meetings, as well as pre-wire inspections when those are acquired um, or, and as well as meter checks. So when we have to go back and check solar meter wiring uh, after an inspection has passed. So just to give some lead time and give you guys some time to adjust to this transition to a new process, uh, it'll roll out in two stages. So as of today, um, all requests for final inspection for non-rebate projects, I will use the solar inspection request form. Um, in addition, all nine final inspections, so roughs, pre-construction meetings, pre-wire inspections, and meter checks, all of those inspection types uh, will be requested through the solar inspection request form as well. Um, and so then after the administrative meeting uh, in September, uh, then we will start having you ex uh, request your final inspections for rebated projects through the solar inspection request form as well. Uh, so for the next month or so, you can continue using EECP and the process we have set up there to request rebated final inspections directly through EECP. Uh, but then by mid-September, we, we will start using this solar inspection request form for those rebated final inspections as well. And I'm going to go over this in more detail later in this meeting um, so that I can try to answer all the questions you may have. Uh, but this is just an upfront uh, announcement to let you know that this new process is beginning. Um, so just take some time to familiarize yourselves with this new request form and uh, we'll talk about it a little bit more later in this meeting too. Uh, but if we go to the next slide here, Sarah, um, this is uh, this just shows where on the solar homepage on the Austin Energy website, um, you you can go to the solar inspections page that we've set up, which also has this inspection request form embedded in it. Uh, and again, I'll show you that specific page later on in this uh, in in this presentation. Um, but now you'll have one standard place uh, to find the inspection request form on our website. Uh, and one standard process for requesting all inspections, so no more confusion about uh, how to request inspection based on the specific type 
or whether it's rebated or not. Uh, you'll just have one way to do all of this. And then if there are any questions, uh, probably best to hold off till I cover more detail on this later in the presentation. But if you have any initial questions right now, feel free to shoot them my way. That's the baton here. All right. I Thanks, Dave. I think Stu? this one's me, yeah. Yep. Uh, cool. So, what's different about Austin? Um, basically, we have a design criteria and an interconnection guide that spell out things that you'll need to do above and beyond uh, what you'll find in the NEC. Um, most of you know this. Uh, we need a solar meter. Uh, for every installation, um, as we're not a net meter utility, um, we have to meter all kilowatt hours from the array uh, through the meter, and that's before we serve any loads or uh, or power any batteries. Um, but we'll get to that in more detail. Um, our color coding uh, is unique too. Um, there's a chart in the design criteria that you can find uh, on page seven that spells that out for all the different services and voltages. Um, we will need a uh, full size neutral through the inverter or, um, or the aggregate panel micro inverters. Um, uh, not 70% as you, as you're going to find in the, in the national code book. Um, also, number 6, uh, copper only as your equipment grounding conductor. Um, from the interconnection point, uh, all the way up to the array. So that's through the roof on, uh, through the attic on the roof, whatever into a junction box. Um. And through the inverter, obviously, um, and that's to be continuous too, um, or irreversibly spliced. Um, and again, uh, no uh, energy storage or loads on the solar side of the PV meter, which we'll more slides about that in a minute. Um, for line side taps, um, your panel must have a main breaker on the load side of the tap, and um, the PV system uh, disconnect has got to be fusible, and um, the enclosure itself needs to be rated for 60 amps minimum. You can obviously have smaller fuses in there, but the, but the disconnect has got to be a 60 amp rated disconnect. Um, the can, uh, it's got to be a Austin Energy stamped meter can with a 200 amp minimum and a bypass handle. Um, there are some, some supply issues that we're kind of facing right now, um, but we'll, uh, we'll talk about that. And if you guys have any questions about um, meter cans and maybe uh if you have to uh find a different can based on supply issues um we can talk with the metering department about that um we want of clearance around all of our meter cans um and that's for uh meter department access and the address numbers that we want um, that can be on the either meter can on the pv meter on the billing or on the uh main panel enclosure itself but it needs to be at least two inches uh, black writing on white. Um, and that's what we like there. Um, as far as shade requirements go, if you're, if you're doing a rebated job, um, we need a 75% uh, ESRF, that's total solar resource fraction, um, which is sort of the, uh, the magic number that distills down all of the uh, considerations for how much, uh, how much sun exposure an array is getting. Um, and if we ask for it, you've got 10 days uh, to submit that to us. Um, and a lightning arrestor um, must be installed on the uh, on the solar side of the PV meter. And that's basically to protect our solar meter. Um, looks like we have a question. How do I read that question? Popped up and then it went away. Okay, you have to open the chat. Um, but, but Lawrence asks, can you confirm what meter cans we can use in the meantime for solar installs? I think she's asking regarding the um, equipment. Yeah. Um, yeah, I don't have a straight answer for you on that one. I know that uh, they're they're kind of just uh, they're making uh, they're making decisions on a case by case basis. Um, so you'll have to find the meter can and then um, submit it to us, um, and then we'll. Uh, uh, it's actually submitting it to, to Joey at the metering department. His his uh, contact information is going to be at the end of this this presentation here. Um, so yeah, unfortunately, I don't have a straight answer for you, but 
Oh, it looks like uh, somebody entered into chat who uh, who you need to contact. Cool. Thank you, Lauren. Um, I guess we're ready for the next slide. Yeah, D David posted um, the AE distribution metering email um, that you can reach out to to the meter shop. Sorry. Fantastic. Thank you, David. They flash up the website a little. Yeah, uh, so this is um, these are the references that you'll need um, in order to uh, complete a successful installation. Obviously, the uh, the National Electric Code. We are on the 2020 cycle. Um, of particular importance for us is going to be Article 690, which covers everything solar, and Article 705, uh, which tells us where and how we can interconnect our systems uh, to the grid. So, um, yeah, the NEC is where to go to find that and your master electrician should have a copy of that book on him, on his or herself at all times. Um, the design criteria, um, just read this provides criteria guidelines, definitions, descriptions approved by the city and the city council, um, for the design and installation of customers electric facilities that will be served by Austin energy. Um, and there are links that you can see right there. Um, the uh, distribution guide uh, is also very important. I think starting on page 25 is of particular relevance to most of the installations we'll be doing. Um, so uh, yeah, please have a copy of that handy. And that uh, that was revised as of a couple months ago in June. So um, just be sure that, that you have the most up-to-date copy of that. Um, so that you're not working off of an out of date copy. Um, the inspection checklist is something that we've been handing out. At least I've been handing it out to uh, add inspections so that you can sort of keep one on hand and inspect your system before we inspect your system. Um, and hopefully that'll improve uh, pass rates. Um, so, uh, and there's a copy of that in the interconnection guide on the EECP website and at the bottom of this presentation as well. Um, and lastly, uh, the electrical city uh, ordinances, that's a smaller document. It's about 15 pages um, and you'll need to reference that. That's just got uh, citywide ordinances, some of which pertain to, to our work in solar. So yeah, next slide. I think this is Val, yeah? I think we can just skip this. It's just it's just letting you know where you can find the various <clears throat> guides here. Um, and so we're just always trying to we know there's a lot of information out there. We're always trying to consolidate it down so that it's really easy for all of your success and um and so you're all up to date and there are no surprises at inspection time. That that's all this is. Cool. Okay, I'm just gonna kind of move right along because I, I don't think there should be any questions there. So I'll give this high level overview and then I'll pass it back to Stuart. Um, so essentially, you know, we've, we've, we have updated this slide since previous meetings, um, but essentially we are, um, just breaking down the steps of the solar project. So, you know, there's the design part that starts at the point of sale, um, followed by the pre-work portion, which is, you know, the meter variances and shutdowns, et cetera, stuff that you need to think about early, early, early on in the process so that you can communicate effectively to your customer. The next step is permitting, of course. Um, I think you're all very familiar with the permitting process and we are always working to try to streamline that. Um, but it is conducted through DST through um, City of Austin, not through Austin Energy. Um, and can all be done through the Austin Building Connect website. Um, then there's installation. Uh, this is where your guidelines, your checklist, this document, the technical training come in, come into um, effect. And just a quick note on that. Um, if your name is on the permit, the work belongs to you. You're accountable for your workmanship. 
And uh, we, we drive that home in a lot of ways, in particular, for those of you who use subcontractors, we're all about using subcontractors. That's how a lot of folks get their experience in the industry. But, um, but we want to make sure that you are owning the quality of the work um, conducted by subcontractors or your own team. Um, so that's why we like to see that accountability work all the way from the name on the permit all the way through the contract. Just keep that in mind. And then finally, of course, where we really come in, the inspection, um, as noted, this is um, this is uh, where the checklist comes in and, and we're working tirelessly to try to streamline this process, make it as transparent and easy to pass inspection as possible. Uh, I'll pass it over to Stuart. Thank you, Sarah. Um, so, uh, as we all know, a good design is a collabor collaboration between sales and design. Um, being familiar with the site is critical because no one project uh, is the same as another. Um, if you have uh, questions or concerns about the project, um, it's going to be better for everyone if you uh, if you request a pre-construction meeting with us so that we can uh, find any potential problems before they start. Um, obviously, building out a system and then finding a problem uh, is going to cost you money. So let's try to avoid that. Um, uh, make sure to look at the equipment wall during the design process. Meter placement and grouping are top errors. Uh, yeah, so um, <clears throat> everything ideally is grouped. All your meters, all your disconnects, everything that's serviceable. Um, it's going to be right there in one spot within 10 feet. Um, obviously there, are, uh, there are reasons why that can not always be the case. Um, and there, there's just a process that we need to go through to make sure that that gets done properly. Uh, commercial projects should always request, request a pre instruction, um, just due to how big they are, how complex they are. Um, and the stakes are a little higher. Things take a lot longer. If there's a mistake. Um, it can slow things down significantly and uh, and time is money. So we want to uh, make sure we're doing it right the first time. Uh, some common errors, service upgrade requirements not met. Um, system doesn't meet the shading requirements. Uh, the roof has less than 10 years of life remaining on it. Um, that's kind of an important one. I mean, that's really just to protect the customer. If their roof needs to be replaced or it's going to be replaced within a few years, you don't want to have the customer spending an extra few thousand dollars to have them remove and reset that array when it happens. So um, I know that's that's kind of tough on the sales guys, but ultimately um, if the customer needs a roof. We should do our uh, due diligence and be honest with them and tell them that um, before you go ahead and put a brand new system on an old roof. Um, and of course, failure to comply with local codes and ordinances. Um, Again, please find the those uh, the links to the documents later in the presentation. I think we covered it on that one. Okay, so what does a good uh, line diagram look like? Um, you can read all these details here. Um, it's sort of a balance between uh, detail and clarity, you know. So you want everything from the array, from the modules down to the interconnection point to be uh, called out on this diagram here. So you've got your number of modules, you've got the size of modules, um, you've got each enclosure, enclosure, each junction box um, listed with wire sizes and over uh, current protection devices, all your breakers um, listed. Uh, disconnects and meters in the proper location. Um, please call out your equipment grounding conductor. Um, and, uh, and also it's important that you're clear exactly how the interconnection is going to happen. Um, and of course it needs to be, uh, certified. Uh, by somebody on, on your staff. Um, and here we go. Here's an example of, uh. Sorry, Stuart, I just want to jump in. Um, the NABSEP doesn't have to be on staff anymore. That's in the old requirement. Uh, the NABSEP does not have to be on staff. Yeah, but it does have to, all, all layouts need to be NABSEP certified or NABSEP. 
Yeah, although that's uh, is there a distinction there between residential and commercial commercial projects? Yes. Am I right there? For on staff, excuse me, for on staff. Yeah. Wait, so just to be clear, um, someone does need to be on, on staff to NABSTEP for a commercial design? I believe that is still in the guidelines, although it is likely we will update that requirement um, moving forward. I see. Oh, sir, sir. Um, okay, so yeah, here's just a good picture of an equipment wall that was done well. Um, this in, this project in particular, not obviously that they have to all be this way, but we've got an aggregate panel coming off of the roof, um, which is labeled as such. Uh, and uh, your warning, uh, passers-by or any service text that uh, you're not supposed to add loads to that panel, um, which is critical because um, that would uh, that would break this rule we have about adding any sort of loads um, before <clears throat> the array production gets metered. So you've got an aggregate panel, you've got your uh, AC disconnect, and then your uh, your last stop before you interconnect is uh, is the PV meter. In this case, uh, obviously, it's a 200 amp can, uh, one of the new ones, and it's got a bypass handle in there too. Um, and then finally, an interconnection inside of the main panel, and a billing meter on the side of the main panel with uh, letters uh, of the address, which are at least two inches high. So um, this is a fantastic job. Also, a little uh, point to note out is they have their monitoring system tied into the ag panel, um, and they've run <clears throat> run it into the uh, the main distribution panel using a Myers hub, which you can't really make out right there. But point there is uh, any knockouts that you make yourself that aren't uh, from the manufacturer should be uh, should be made with a uh, a weather tight seal like a Myers hub. So, um, good job on that one. Oh, yeah, Roy points out too, there's a lightning arrestor on that aggregate panel too, on the side there, on the far right. So, keep that one in mind too. And what do we have next? Um, so, line side taps. Um, some uh, common errors if you need to do a line side tap is uh, your solar disconnect is greater than 10 feet from the tap itself. Um, which uh, 705 disallows. Um, another error is there's not enough room in the panel. Um, I've got a slide, or the next slide will kind of spell that out a little more clearly. And um, your disconnect is not 60 amp rated. So don't put a 30 amp disconnect on a line side tap. We'll have to call you on that. Uh, next. Yeah. Um, so yeah, here's. Uh, Two examples of a line side tap. The one on the left is bad. Um, it violates NEC 376.56. You can't even really see the taps, but they're there on the side. So that's a side mounted uh, main breaker. That's like a 125 amp side mounted main breaker. And there's just not room in there to safely tap onto those service conductors. Um, so um, that is not the way to perform a tap. And we'll have to call you on that too. Um, um, yeah, in addition to that, it, uh, it violates the uh, manufacturer's specs who say that you've got to run your, uh, your conductors straight through those taps. So, um, and then on the right there, um, is a good example of how it should be done. You got plenty of room at the top and that empty space inside of that, uh, closure. So that's the way to perform a tap. Um, there are ways if, so if you come across a panel, like you see on the left there. Um, this one might require an upgrade, honestly, but in certain situations, you'll have a, a side fed main breaker um, and you can call for a, a repair in which you can uh, just replace those service conductors in order to make them longer so that you have access to the conductors up in that empty space mm -hmm. at the top there. Um, thank you, cursor. Um, and so that that may or may not uh, be something that you can do based on the panel, but um, that's what the. Uh, the pre construction meeting would be for. So that's line side taps. Um, and then we'll have Val speak with us about the shade requirements. Yeah. Thanks, Val. Hi, everybody. Um, 
things that we look for in addition to electrical integrity is that the solar panels sit in the spot where they're going to produce well, um, both for the customers and also for to receive the rebate, of course. Um, so as we mentioned, uh, we have 75% total solar resource fraction, and that's a combination of the tilt and azimuth, and it's also a combination of the solar access. So if we are looking at applications or if we are, um, you know, doing an inspection and it looks to us like the system is not achieving that amount of solar access um, and, you know, for the tilt and orientation of the panels, then we will request a shade analysis. So when we request a shade analysis, it needs to be on site. Uh, we understand that you guys use Aurora. You're welcome to use uh, Aurora and similar um, software all day long to do solar estimates. Um, however, you know, in order for Aurora to work, your team has to plug in the right information. Um, you know, there, there's a human error uh, possibility there. So by the time that we request a shade analysis, uh, at that point, we want to see an on-site analysis. So, um, so when you're doing your analysis, uh, at our request, we'll send a, a note to you asking uh, asking for one. You're going to need to send somebody to site. Um, you need to take pictures at the corners of the different arrays. You need to identify where the photos were taken. Um, and when I say pictures, I'm writing solar assessment tool, so it could be a solar pathfinder. You could be using the Solmetric Semi. Uh, we've started to receive Scanafly as well, which is uh, drone based, but but again, the photos are taken from the roof looking up. Um, yeah, so we need to be able to see multiple photos for the arrays. We need to know where they're located. And then a lot of the software based tools like Solmetric or Scanafly, they, they will go ahead and they'll produce a report that will give the TOF and the um, solar access and the TSRF numbers. Um, so when you're using those tools, like a Solmetric or a Scanify, please make sure that you are, are for each array that you're entering in the information of what the azimuth and tilt angle is. Uh, it, it, these are can be more accurate tools, but your team still needs to uh, enter in the right information. Um, and then, uh, you know, the, the reports we've seen what a full report looks like. I've also seen where someone's submitted a report and they deleted things from the report because it didn't look good. So, you know, don't do that. Um, it makes me lose faith in humanity and, you know, it's tough enough to get up every morning. So, um, please submit the full report without alternate. Um, please have the coordinates and, and the location, you know, specific information be accurate. Um, please do it within 10 days and please upload it into ECP um, so that it's there and connected with that file, right, that we've requested. Um, and, and again, uh, this stuff is in our program guidelines as well, but the, uh, the 75 percent, that's an average for the entire system. So, it is possible you could have, you know, you could have some arrays that are, you know, in some panels that are a little more shaded, but we're asking for a system average uh, of 75 or higher. Um, and please don't confuse the TSRF number with the solar access number. Um, solar access just measures, measure, excuse me, measures shade, where the TSRF also takes into account the pitch and orientation of the panels um, to get a, a clear view of what is going to be produced. Um, uh, next, and there's one more slide, please. And can I add a little bit to the, um, a little bit of commentary to this slide, please? Yes, sir. So um, some of you um, are, are also doing unrebated systems. And um, it's been brought to my attention lately that, um, and, and I've known this is happening, but um, systems that don't meet our qualification and um, still installing them, but just not applying for rebates. If that is the case, then to um, communicate very well to the customer that they are not eligible for the incentive also to communicate accurate 
uh, production factors based on the system and the shading that's present. Um, if we find that you're out there um, not communicating well to the customers that they're not eligible for incentives, so in other words, you've led them to believe that they are or um, you know, haven't really clearly communicated that they're not. Um, and if we find that you're not accurately um, projecting the uh, production of that system and you're in our program, it's going to be a problem because we see that as being um, and it's harmful to our customers and a lot of them extremely in, in all of these details and when they find out the system isn't producing they get really upset not only with you but with us and so um you know we want to protect them and we provide that education so that they can help themselves but we also are administrating a program here and if you if for whatever reason you're in the program and you're out there not acting ethically then it's um, going to be a compliance issue with us. So just I, um, we really frown upon um, you guys uh, installing systems in the shade. Obviously, this is bad for the industry. So please try to locate the panels in the sun and be very clear with your customers about um, what the anticipated production is. Thank you. Uh, no, I'm I'm glad you spoke to that, Tim. And and I understand too that the people in this room um, are not necessarily also the sales folk. And you know, a lot of times, installing solar in two shady places that you know that problem starts at sales, right? And and I know every company is working on automating processes and and trying to reduce the sales and marketing costs as much as possible, right? Um, but, you know, we talk about shade in, in all of our contractor trainings um, and, you know, this is our plea to you guys, the technical crew um, to, you know, to be aware of this, uh, to consider it when you are going onto the site, you know, and you're looking at where the panels are going to be installed. Um, you know, if, if it, if it's something that doesn't make you proud, um, yeah, please talk about it with your company, you know, uh, and with your sales folks. And, and so, you know, too, on the calf, on the new calf, why do we keep on changing the calf, right? I know it's annoying. Um, we've added uh, for the salesperson to put their email. So when I come across super shady things, I'm not just, um, I'm not just emailing your admin. I'm also contacting the salesperson that's doing it. Um, so we can try to, you know, nip this at the roots, right? Um, but yeah, to Tim's point, it's awful for the industry. And then we get heartbroken uh, solar customers calling us, trying to figure out why they're paying these loans now for 20 years uh, ahead of them, and they're not getting the savings that they expected from their solar system. Um, and this isn't why any of us join solar. So please help us out, help us help them. Um, and uh, I know some of you guys are um, are very up to date on how to do a shade tool, but in case you don't, um, and I'm getting a note, I need to talk faster. Good, good point. Okay. Um, in case you don't, this slide here helps a little bit. It's a snapshot of uh, of a, um, a soul metric device, and so what you can see there is that. They're trees and it's winter time, right? And you can see that there's a little bit of green where the branches are, but in the summer, we can imagine that those trees will have leaves. I mean, I know everything's different after the February event, but, um, but that those are going to flush out. So if you look at it, this solar access tool without being properly, uh, you know, edited um, says that the annual TSRF uh, or solar access on this one, sorry, is 81%. Um, However, you can imagine in the summer that that is not the case and the tool doesn't know to flush out the trees for, for one thing or another. So, you know, we would, we're anticipating, even if you guys are taking these photos in the winter time, we're an, anticipating, you can go in there and edit it. And um, with those little brushes in the bottom corner, the green and the yellow um, of, of the center picture, you can go in, click on those and then flush out what the shade will really look like, especially in those, those key summer months. 
Um, so when you guys are submitting reports, please just don't submit screen, like photos of your soul metric. The software, you know, the device comes with software to kick out a report. We'd like to see the whole report. Um, and please don't try to edit things on the report because uh, uh, when we see that, it makes us sad. Um, I think that's that's my notes on the shading. If you guys have any questions about that, please do email Solarat. Um, and uh, yeah, anything you guys can do to help us keep the solar panels for the sunshines, we really appreciate that. Questions? Thanks, Val. I think we're just gonna try to power on through because I know we are we have about thirty minutes left of time and about half the presentation to go. So. I'm just really going to blow through this pre work slide. I know that there may be a lot of questions about shutdowns. Um, but I just wanted to so just really briefly, if you are um, applying for a meter variance, um, please apply before you start installing, because if you get rejected, then you're going to have to redo a lot of work and that's going to cost you time and money and probably upset your customer. How do you request a meter variance? Call, email Abdur with the following information, one line diagram, proposed placard language, and supporting documents about why you need a meter variance. Requests can take up to two weeks and are not always granted, which is why we, again, strongly encourage you to apply before you start installing. Um, and as always, with all of these things, please communicate to your customers what is going on. When we have to answer, by the time your customers call us and ask us why there is a delay or why you're having to reinstall the meters and poke a bunch of holes inside of their house, uh, you've already failed at your communication. So please communicate to them before they call us. Um, the bigger issue, the bigger elephant in the room is temporary shutdowns. This is, you know, you might have to request this if you're doing service upgrades or transfer switches, et cetera. Um, and a quick note, when you do need a service shutdown, you must pull a separate permit for the shutdown. The lead time for that is six months. So all of that to say that if you can avoid it, you should try. Um, if you are doing a service upgrade, if a service upgrade is the reason for your shutdown and you can use the line side tap to bypass the service to avoid having to do the service upgrade, we recommend doing that. Um, I understand that, you know, that's that's not always uh, something that is feasible given um, the points that Stuart made earlier in the presentation, but uh, that's just uh, one way to get around it. If, if your um, battery storage system is the reason for the shutdown, then you will pull one permit for the solar plus ESS and we will partially pass it for the solar system. And, um, and then you will need to communicate clearly to your customer that while their solar may be turned on, their battery is not available for use until that shutdown and the transfers which are completed. Um, in order to request a shutdown, you need to call um, one of these two numbers, depending on whether you are north or south of the river, um, and request it um, over by phone, or you may email AE distribution metering at austinenergy.com. Again, we are working with this other department to try to help them figure out how to shorten that lead time, but it is six months right now. And so please, please, please communicate that really clearly to your customers. Um, sorry, I have a question here. Since we have to schedule a temporary power shutdown one day in advance, we also have to call one day prior. My recommendation is that you should just always call the day before your shutdown. I mean, you know, it, to the extent that you have the bandwidth, I would just call because because they have such a long wait time, they're fairly um, rigid about if you don't call or you don't follow everything sort of to a T that you will get kicked to the back of the line. And we don't want that to happen to you guys. We don't want that to happen to our solar customers. So um, just be aware of this. Like I said, we're working hard to, to ameliorate the problem, but it's outside of our department. So we have limited input. Okay, next. Um, and this is just a quick note, Stuart, I pulled your slide up here. Um, cool. Thanks. Yeah, do you want to speak sure. to the variance thing? Um, sure. So uh, if you're wondering, do you need a meter variance? Um, 
In the left picture, yes, you do. You notice there's a fence in between the billing meter and the EV meter. They're closer than 10 feet from each other, but there's a fence in the way. So you need a variance. Um, the metering department won't set that meter. You don't have uh, a variance. Well, that's not true. We won't pass it uh, if I don't see, if one of the inspectors doesn't see uh, an approved variance from up there at the time of inspection. Um, if you're just uh, putting the meter on the other side of a gas meter like this right here, but it's not crossing a fence, um, you don't need a variance for that. So, yeah, that's the big distinction. Thanks. Awesome. Thank you. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to keep blowing through. We can please uh, put your questions in the chat or hold to the end of the presentation. All right, permitting, passing it over to David. All right, so uh, the important point to remember here, every solar project uh, in Austin Energy Territory requires an auxiliary power electrical permit, um, which is issued by the city's development services department. Uh, DSD handles all permitting and that is not an Austin Energy uh, thing. So if you need a permit, make sure to contact DSD, apply through the Austin Build and Connect portal uh, when you need an electrical permit or any other type of permit uh, from the city. So every solar project needs an auxiliary power permit. That's how you apply right there on the right side of the box. Uh, these are a couple other types of permits that you may need for your project. Uh, building permit, which um, would apply toward new construction, uh, as well as um, commercial solar installations have a building permit uh, to which the auxiliary power electrical permit is usually a child permit. Uh, if you're installing an electric vehicle charging station, for instance, this is the type of electrical permit uh, that you would pull for that. Um, we'll go over on the next page quickly as well that uh, service upgrades or other work on the service requires its own separate type of electrical permit. So, of course, make sure you pull that permit uh, before you start work on the solar installation. So make sure to have that active auxiliary power permit in hand. Um, for rebated projects, please make sure that if you are the contractor that has contracted the uh, system uh, with the customer, uh, make sure that it is your name on that auxiliary power permit. Um, the permit and the contract must be under one contractor's name. Uh, subcontractors should not be pulling the auxiliary power permit for rebated projects. That's very important to remember. Um, and again, work on the electric service needs to be completed. Uh, and that permit needs to be closed out before you request your final inspection for solar. Uh, we cannot do the final solar inspection if you have any sort of service upgrade, service rebuild permits still open. Uh, so make sure to contact the Development Services Department to schedule inspection on that. Uh, a few common errors here. Um, one another important one is that if you have any outstanding balances on your permits um, and, and the permit is not clean, uh, then we're not able to close that permit out. Uh, so make sure that you have all those fees paid off before you request your final inspection from us. Uh, make sure that uh, you have one permit per interconnection. Uh, if there's let's see one residential meter per premise. Um, and I'll kind of just skip over those other two points for now. I think those those kind of largely speak to the way the premises would be set up in those two situations. Go to the next slide. All right, and note about the ETJ as well. So the ETJ is defined as anything that is inside Austin Energy Service Territory, but is outside the Austin city limits. Uh, so I know we've had some confusion in the past, um, even though you may also need to request permit from the other jurisdiction like Pflugerville or Bee Cave or Dale Valley uh, in which you're installing. In those situations, you always need an auxiliary power permit from the city of Austin as well uh, for your solar installation. So just make sure that in addition to any permits you need from that other jurisdiction that you're also pulling the auxiliary power permits uh, with the city of Austin. Uh, and this is some template uh, language that you can use for your permit description. Uh, we highly recommend using this format of language really for all auxiliary power permits, whether or not you are in the ETJ or whether you're inside city limits. Um, and then if your project includes energy storage, this is important. We do want to make sure that you're including the language about the energy storage system as well in that permit. Uh, just so that our inspectors are as aware as possible that there is energy storage included uh, because that's, a, that's another important thing for us to be aware of. And next slide. Uh, and with every auxiliary power permit application, you are also required to submit an approved distributed generation planning application. Uh, this is an important uh, document um, for you know all new distributed generation resources that are going on to our grid, uh, including solar. Uh, so for smaller 
for smaller DG systems that are less than 50 kilowatts AC, uh, these DGPAs are automatically approved uh, by Austin Energy. Uh, so you don't actually need to submit them to us for a pre-approval. Just go ahead and submit them with your auxiliary power permit application. Um, for system sizes from 50 kilowatts up to 500 kilowatts AC, uh, that requires a review by our team here, uh, the solar team. Um, so submit to DGPA review at austinenergy.com and request approval and we'll go ahead and review that and let you know whether or not your DGPA is approved. Um, anything that is above 500 kilowatts uh, AC or that is new construction or anything that is on the downtown network, um, that will require review by our engineering team here at Austin Energy uh, for those bigger systems or that need special types of interconnection with our grid. Uh, but so you can submit those um, larger projects to DGPA review as well. Um, anything on the downtown network, same thing, submit to DGPA review. And of course, to find out if you're on the downtown network or not, you can email our engineering team at this email at the bottom. Um, but another quick note too, and uh, we've tried to make this clear in the last few months, that if you're installing a combined solar and storage system, uh, and the entire combined output of that system has the potential uh, to be above 50 kilowatts AC when you include storage peak power in that calculation, uh, then in that case, we would like you to submit uh, the DGPA for our initial review as well. Uh, and I think y'all have been doing a good job with that so far. So just please keep sending us those combined systems that are above 50 kW. And next slide, please. All right. I think we'll just yeah keep powering through. Uh, this one's on me. Thanks, David. Um, so this is mainly for uh, larger installations, commercial projects. Um, if you have a CT meter, uh, the inspection request is uh, process is different. Um, you've got a CT meter that'll be used for the installation. You have to contact the uh, meter dispatch group. Uh, their phone number and email address here is below um, to schedule the installation and inspection after the PV system is installed but before you request a final inspection with us. Uh, and a rule of thumb is if that meter can is uh, bigger than 225 amps. All righty. Um, so uh, more about metering. Um, they must be accessible 24 hours a day um, for any Austin Energy employee that needs to access them. Um, Absence of a variance, uh, you'll need them to be grouped and within 10 feet of each other. Um, we want three feet of clearance in front of the meter. So you should be able to stand in front of the meter, reach your hand out and not be able to touch the meter without anything behind you. Um, and two inches of clearance on all sides of, uh, of any meter that belongs to Austin Energy. Um, cut seals, uh, this is a big deal. If you find one on site, um, you need to report it to this number here. Um, the current diversion dispatch. Um, if you don't, you might be held liable. So just be aware of that. You uh, but take a note if you can uh, whether or not the seal should should be there. Um, obviously, very infrequently you'll find a cut seal, but if you do, that's the number to call. Um, common errors: upside down meter. Uh, meter is too high or out of reach. So that's uh, six feet is the is the high mark uh, for the center of the meter cam. Um, Improper meter cans, ones that aren't stamped by us. Um, if the meter is behind a locked gate and in inspection, uh, just please be aware that that gate needs to be accessible uh, for us at the time of inspection. Um, temporary meter left inside of a permanent meter. Oh yeah. Um, so uh, yeah, when we show up for inspection, there should be no meter and the system should not be running. Unless of course we've talked to you, uh, you know, immediately before the inspection and you've got the thing running so that we can inspect. Um, but at no point should you be running your PV system prior uh, to inspection. Um, and don't knock out your own holes in the meter can. Um, you've got to use the factory KOs. Uh, the metering department will not set the meter if they if they see that. So, so we could possibly miss that as an inspector and the metering department's still not going to set the meter. So, um, yeah, don't make your own holes in meter cans. All righty. Um, kind of more of the same here. This is a pretty uh, dense slide. It's got a lot of information, so study this one. Um, again, the two inches around all meter cans. Um, we want three feet 
minimum radius around the uh, around the gas meter, and that's the regulator. Uh, we don't fortunately have a good picture of exactly where that is, but maybe you guys are familiar with that. Um, and if you have any questions, you can contact us. No plastic anchors. Um, no plastic anchors. Uh, Roy is reminding me um, in the meter cans. They got to be uh, something that's uh, not plastic, metal, tap cones, something like that. Um, we need a an overhead clearance of six and a half feet uh, in front of the meter and uh, to the center of that meter. Um, the top mark is 72 inches and no lower than uh, two and a half feet. Um, yeah, that should cover it on this one. Uh, please break the neutral in both the meter can and the AC disconnect. As you can see here, it's done. You got a, an isolation uh, neutral bar in the meter can and a Polaris block in the uh, in the disconnect. Please do that. That's for uh, serviceability. Um, if the existing service is questionable, um, reach out to us. Um, yeah. You see something like this, uh, obviously some work is going to have to be done. Um, so let's uh, let's answer those questions before you start work. Um, and back to ESS too. So, like we said, um, this is an this diagram here is in the interconnection guide, um, and it's it's referencing an AC coupled system. Um, so, uh, like I had mentioned before, we can't have batteries or loads on the solar side of the PV meter. So, in this diagram here, you can see that um, this is like a partial home backup, but all the loads and the batteries that are being fed um, happen after the kilowatt hours from the array are metered. Um, so that's an important distinction. Um, we don't allow DC coupling because there's there's simply no way to uh, to tie in DC coupling um, and not have it uh, on the uh, load side of the meter or the PV meter. But the reason for that um, is that it uh, our billing system isn't able to uh, to capture and um, Properly bill the customer if there are loads on the solar side of the solar meter. So hopefully that clears that up. But again, we're here with any questions. And next. Um, yeah, so uh, placards and the location of the batteries. Uh, picture on the left there. Basically, if you can take a picture like I took right there and you can see the service equipment and you can see the batteries. Um, that is within sight and it's within 50 feet. You still need a placard, um, but that placard doesn't have to be uh, calling out um, the location of the batteries and their disconnects. Um, but of course, all proper labeling still needs to be in place. Uh, the picture on the right, um, that ESS is not within sight. Those That's probably 50 feet across that yard and the batteries are on the other side of that garage wall. So you do need a placard that does call out location of batteries and their disconnects. And uh, yeah, please refer to 705 for more information on that. Any questions? Perfect. All right, cool. We started to talk a little bit earlier about the new standard process for requesting all types of solar inspections. So I'll get into that a little bit more here. Uh, what you see here in the screenshot on the right is just a quick snapshot of what our new solar inspection request form looks like. Uh, again, it will be found on the Austin Energy website uh, through the link here. Uh, we also have a shortcut uh, go link that uh, we'll be pro providing on a later slide as well. So starting today, all non-rebated inspections for final inspection, uh, and then also um, all non-final inspection types like rough inspections, pre-construction meetings and the like, all of those will be requested through this form here. Uh, so this request form is embedded on the web page um, and there's a submit button at the bottom of that page. So it's just an online submission. You don't need to download the form or email it to us or anything like that. Just enter the information right there on the web and hit submit. Uh, and it will automatically send the data to us uh, via the Smartsheet platform. Uh, Smartsheet will allow us to keep track of all your inspections and the order in which they came in in our queue. And we'll do all of our scheduling uh, through Smartsheet as well, and we'll send you notifications uh, through Smartsheet, which I'll get into that in a second as well. Um, so at this point, 
uh, please do not email your inspection requests for non-rebated inspections or for roughs or pre-construction. Uh, please do not send any email requests for those to solar inspections at Austin Energy. Uh, we're going to stop using that inbox for those types of inspection requests uh, and switch to this inspection request form uh, as of today. Um, I realized that with the transitioning to you know new processes using new technology tools that you know there may be some issues that arise. So um, once you submit your first inspection request to us through this new tool, uh, you can go ahead and shoot um, an email just confirming it to Solar Inspections at Austin Energy just to make sure that um, I can confirm that we received it. Uh, just to make sure that the tool is working properly for you and that there aren't any issues we need to fix. Um, but it's been well tested and I believe it's uh, it's going to work nice and well for you guys. And hopefully it'll clear up any types of confusion about how to request the different types of inspections you may need in relation to solar. Uh, and then as for final inspections for rebated projects, we'll start using this request form after the administrative meeting in September, um, just to give some ramp up time for you guys to get used to this inspection request form for all other types of uh, inspection requests. Um, so let's see. So the inspection request form has a number of fields. It collects um, a group of standard information uh, from you about the inspections that uh, you need to have performed. Um, and so just we'll send out more information later on how to fill out the form as well, just so that you have more clear instruction from me uh, on what we're expecting in those fields. We'll go to the next slide here. And a little, a few more notes on those types of non final inspections. So, for instance, rough inspections, if you're unsure what that is, this is where the conductors will not be accessible uh, at the time of final inspection. So, if like the conduit is going to be buried or it's going to be inside of a wall and covered up by the time of final inspection, uh, go ahead and request a rough inspection with us through that form. Uh, and we can take a look at the conduit at uh, the wiring for you uh, and make sure it's good to go. Um, Pre-construction meetings, these are generally uh, design consultations with our inspectors where you can meet with them on site uh, and ask them any questions you have about, uh, you know, how to interconnect with our grid, um, different layouts, um, requirements that you need to meet um, and put together a plan for that particular project in case you have any questions, if it's an unusual uh, site characteristic situation. Uh, it's highly recommended for new contractors in particular, but Really, anytime you have an unusual project where you have some additional questions about the layout, we definitely uh, suggest a pre-construction meeting with our inspectors. So you can also select that inspection type through the new form as well. Uh, and we do discourage next day inspection requests. We do have a much shorter wait time now than we did a few couple months ago, uh, but still next day requests, we would, we'd rather not um, have them be as urgent as that. We can usually get them out pretty quickly these days. All right, next slide, please. Sorry, really quick, a couple of questions from Farwell that I just want to address oh, sure. to the group. Um, one is, will the ske scheduled inspection show up in Amanda? Um, no, right now we are not able to integrate with Amanda. Again, um, DSD owns Amanda, they're part of the city and you know, does the conjoined twins separated at birth? Austin Energy has to do um, Quite a bit of work to to sort of link into their systems. However, this amazing solution that David has come up with will auto generate an email to both you and the customer once the inspection is scheduled. Yes, and I believe, yeah, we're going to cover that in a couple slides too, just so you can see what the new type of notification will look like. But it will be similar to what you've been receiving through EECP uh, and also through uh, email for non rebate inspections. So pre-wire for solar, this is another type of inspection that may be needed for installation. Um, and in this case, this is where the conduit that is being installed is going to be is specifically for future solar use, uh, but there's no solar installation presently planned. So this is usually something that applies to new construction uh, where they want to have the option to go solar in the future. Um, so before that conduit is covered up, you would need to re request a pre-wire for solar inspection. Uh, so for residential pre-wire for projects inside the city limits, uh, that's something the development services department and their electrical inspectors will inspect. So for those specific types of pre-wire inspections, please, uh, um, please request the inspection through the ABNC portal. Uh, for all other types of pre-wire, so whether it's residential and in the ETJ, or whether it's a commercial pre-wire inspection, 
uh, continue to request those inspections uh, with our team using the inspection request form. And we have a specific inspection type um, in the field in that form called rough inspection pre-wire that you can select for that purpose. All right, next slide. All right, so the notifications, um, as you know, as those of you who've worked with us before know, you're used to receiving uh, notifications from us at certain points of the inspection process. Uh, so that will continue with the new um, inspection request form and scheduling through Smartsheet. So you will receive emails that are sent from Smartsheet. Uh, those emails will be sent out at several points of the inspection process. Uh, you'll get one once you first submitted the form and request an inspection. Uh, you'll get another one when we actually schedule the inspection. So you'll receive the date and time uh, through that email. Um, also, you'll receive emails uh, if the inspection has to be postponed or canceled. For example, if there's an issue with the permits uh, or if you've informed us that you're not ready uh, in advance of inspection. Um, or if we need to reschedule the inspection after we've initially scheduled it and we need to set a new date and time, you'll receive notification of that as well. And as always, you'll also receive an email from us uh, when the inspection is completed. So you'll be notified whether it has passed or failed. And we're also working on notifications in the future for when the PV meter is installed. And while that notification is not enabled just yet, uh, that is something we are planning to have in the future just so that we can alert you and the customer that the meter has been set. So again, working on that. Um, let's see. So for these notifications that are coming out of Smartsheet, the sender on those emails will always be Austin Energy Solar Inspections via Smartsheet. That's the tag that is applied to the email. Um, so just in order to avoid any potential for these messages to end up in your spam folder, uh, I would go through whatever spam filter you have and make sure you add this email address here, automation at app.smartsheet.com uh, to add that email address as a safe sender. Uh, that's to ensure that it does not get filtered through to spam. Um, so the solar inspections at Austin Energy email address, uh, though you'll no longer be requesting inspections for non rebated projects or for roughs or pre-construction through that email, you can continue to contact us there for any other inspection related questions you have, uh, including those that relate to any issues you may have with uh, submitting through Smartsheet. Uh, we're happy to answer those questions, troubleshoot any issues that you have. Uh, so I see a question here on the side. Will our company's existing emails that are getting informed continue to be the ones getting these notices? So the inspection request form uh, has a field in it for the contractor to enter their email address. So the email address you would enter in that field would be uh, whoever the point person is at your company who wants to receive all the inspection related notifications. Uh, so I would just suggest if you're the one who is requesting the inspection uh, and you you intend to be the one who um, is on the inspection notifications later on, just to put your email in that specific field of the form. And that'll make sure that uh, you continue to receive all notifications from us throughout the process. All right, next slide, please, Sarah. And this is just a quick overview of what those inspections uh, notifications will look like when you come from Smartsheet. So on the left, we have uh, one that's set up for you to receive right after you request your inspection. Uh, on the right is one that you'd be set up to receive uh, once your inspection is scheduled. So these emails will look standard, uh, the language will be standard, but you always receive an email from us uh, whenever these key checkpoints of the inspection process have been passed. And uh, they'll always have this Austin Energy logo on them as well. Um, and the subject line should make it pretty clear what the purpose of that message is. All right, next slide. All right, so now that I've told you about this new standard process, a couple notes on how to prepare for um, inspection and be ready once you get there. So how to be a rock star at an inspection, make sure you send a qualified electrical worker um, to your inspection. So one of these types here. Uh, and make sure to come prepared with the necessary project documentation. So please make sure to bring the layout in the one line as well as your electrician's license documentation. Uh, and please also make sure to always bring tools in case you need to make any corrections on site. Um, if our inspectors find deficiencies, if they're you know, less major in terms of correction requirements, uh, very often our inspectors will allow you to make those corrections right there on site. And that can be the difference between 
costs and failing your inspection that day. So always important to remember those tools. Next slide. And in general, preparing for an inspection, um, these are these are some instructions for you to keep in mind uh, to make sure you're as ready as can be. Uh, so before installation, make sure that you're referring to the dig uh, and all of the interconnection requirements laid out there. Um, as mentioned earlier, if you have any questions that uh, are not answered by the dig, please request a pre-construction meeting with one of our inspectors uh, to get feedback on your plans for that particular project, especially if you're faced with an unusual layout situation. Um, before final inspection, just make sure you're doing your quality checks, testing the system out, checking it against the um, interconnection guide and our new inspection checklist, uh, which we'll show you on the next slide. But um, just make sure you check for common errors, uh, poor cable hey, management, loose wire connections. Oh, go ahead, Stuart. Sorry, I have one comment here. Um, on these yeah. new screenless inverter systems where there's just no way to tell if the system's working, um, make sure whoever's attending the inspection, uh, they're familiar with the app or whatever it is that can show us that the system is uh, performing at full capacity. Thank you. Awesome. Thanks, Stuart. So, yes, these common errors are just uh, very important things to check for, things that um, we found have come up consistently in inspections that fail. Uh, so just make sure it's part of your quality check that you're looking at these things uh, as well. Um, Farwell, to answer your question, you do not need a permit before you request a pre-construction meeting. Uh, that's one thing you don't need the auxiliary power permit for uh, before requesting from us. Correct, even for commercial, that doesn't require the permit either before pre-con. All right, and I mentioned the new inspection checklist. So this is the document that our inspectors are using and filling at each inspection they go to now. Uh, this is what the deficiencies section of that checklist is. Uh, so they'll be referring to this deficiencies list um, when going through their inspections and making sure that everything checks out. Um, and so for any, any inspection that fails, uh, a copy of this checklist will now be uploaded to the permits uh, in the A, B, and C portal. Um, so our inspectors will attach the, the filled out checklist for that inspection to the permit folder. Uh, that is how we will share with you what the deficiencies uh, on that project were so that you know what needs to be corrected before you request a reinspection from us. Uh, and so if we go to actually just to mention that this checklist is obviously a useful uh, tool for you to uh, quality check your systems before you request inspection so that you can see what things we're looking at uh, when we come out to inspect. So if we go to the next slide here real quick. This will just uh, have some quick instructions for you on how to find the inspection checklist that is completed um, for inspections that fail. Uh, so when you go into the A, B, and C portal and you go into the permit folder for your auxiliary power permit, uh, there's a section called folder attachment, and you will find the completed checklist uh, with the list of deficiencies uh, under that folder attachment section. Just a quick note. As we move away from using EECP for inspection management, um, just basically to streamline everything, this is going to be your point of record for all of the communications around your inspection. Um, you know, until we fully move over to the new inspection scheduling strategy, we'll still in employ EECP, but you know, in the very near future, we will be moving completely over to this, and this should streamline, you know, we're trying to make it more consistent so that rebated and unrebated projects get communicated to in the same exact way. Exactly. And this provides a way to streamline the process for both rebated and non-rebated projects uh, because I know, yeah, we've always had the deficiencies reported through EECP, but this provides us uh, a nice efficient way to do it for both streams of projects. I think the last section here is our um, contact slides. So actually a quick slide on ESS. So I'll hand the mic back over for a sec. And just really quick before I launch Stuart on this, um, I know that we are at time. So those of you who need to jump off, please make sure to put your, your name and the name of your company in the chat so that we can keep track of the attendance for this meeting. And um, this is especially important if you're required to attend this meeting 
um, because you are a new contractor or because of um, compliance request that you attend this meeting. So please go ahead and get those into the chat, but we're also going to give you some great ESS guidance here. So stick around if you have time. Thanks. Um, yeah, so I'll take this one. Uh, ESS must be submitted with the, uh, the DGPA that accurately documents the size of the system. Um, so please make sure to include ESS in the language on the permit application. So that's like in the description, just put like solar plus ESS and then the DGPA will ask you specifically for the size of, of both of those components. Um, about the installation of it, uh, your battery has got to be UL 9540 listed. So if uh, you're going to build your own battery, uh, just be aware that it's going to be a, uh, a lengthy process to get it you all listed. Um, there's no DC to DC interconnections. Um, uh, permitted on our grid. Um, ESS may not be installed in a conditioned space. No bedrooms, closets, pretty much uh, detached or attached garage and outside. It's kind of all the only place you can put it. Um, please also follow the uh, the manufacturer's instructions on um, how to install those batteries as far as like clearances and distances between them. Um, batteries installed in the garage require a review by the local to fire department. So what we're asking for an in inspection actually is just that you reach out to the fire department at that email address right there. Um, AFD hazmat at Austin, Texas.gov. Um, so during that inspection, um, we'll ask that, uh, ask to see some email that you've done your due diligence that you've, uh, you've reached out to the fire department. Um, and you've submitted a plan set, what they're going to look for basically is, uh, the size, um, and location of the batteries on the premises. Um, so we'll ask for that. Um, this is an important 1, any ESS projects with permits submitted after July 26th. So a couple weeks ago, um, are required to have their plan set reviewed and endorsed by an electrical engineer with a professional engineering license. Uh, be attached to the ox power permit and presented at the final inspection. So, yeah, we will call for those uh, coming up here pretty soon at our inspections uh, for that endorsement and, um, and it will be failed. If we don't, uh, we don't see it. All righty. Thanks guys. And you can find in that at the end of this PowerPoint, um, some helpful links and contact information for various departments. Um, we've tried to consolidate all of this, all of the sort of key contact information into these two excellent slides. Um, and that's just, you know, for your reference, feel free to put them up in your office. That way you're not waiting on us to return a phone call or an email to you to give you that information if you're looking for something specific. So um, we appreciate you guys and we hope you have an awesome, an awesome week and weekend. And feel free to um, ask some questions. I know that uh, Stu and myself and a few others can stick around for a few more minutes afterwards if you have any specific questions. Thank you so much. And we can stop recording, Stu.